Welcome Riverbend, so glad to have you. My name is Brooke, I'm one of the pastors here at Riverbend, and we just want to welcome you to this week's gathering. We want you to know that we're so glad you're here and tuning in from your home, and as you go throughout the gathering today, we want to remind you to participate, be ready for what the Spirit might want to do, and enjoy your time with one another. Lost at the fall Running away would not hear you call But Father, you worked your will I had no righteousness of my own I had no right to draw near your throne But Father, you loved me still And in love before you laid the world's foundation Destined to adopt me as your own, and you raised me so high above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. You left your home to seek out the lost, you knew the great and terrible cost. Jesus, your face was set. I worked my fingers down to the bone, but nothing I did could ever atone. But Jesus, you paid my debt. And by your blood, I have redemption and salvation. Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown. And you rose that I might be a new creation. I am born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. Spirit, you made me see I swore I knew the way on my own A head full of rocks, a heart made of stone But Spirit, you moved in me And at your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened On my darkest heart, the light Christ has shown, called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken, heaven's citizen by grace and grace alone, I will stand by faith by grace and grace alone, I will run this race by grace and grace alone. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone And I will reach the end by grace and grace alone Hey Riverbend, welcome back to Home Church. If I'm being fully honest, I miss seeing you week to week and worshiping in one big group. But at the same time, I am loving my home church. We're having great conversation, amazing times of prayer, and we're just having a lot of fun. And I know from the conversations that I've had with many of you, you the, the feeling is mutual. We're, we're having a similar experience. This is actually a really great and fun new way to experiment with church. And I'm so glad you're along for the ride. And I hope that you came 
ready to discuss today because we have another amazing passage for us to work through together. So by now you have read Ephesians 4 verses 12 through 16. And if you haven't, now would be a great time to pause the video and nominate somebody to read right now. Um, so my job today is super simple. It's just to help us understand the, the scripture clearly and to offer some pastoral reflection. And your job is to discuss how these things come to life in your home church. So let's get after it. Verse 12, one more time says this, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Okay, so we're sort of picking this up mid-sentence. So reach back with me all the way back to last week's conversation. Jesus has given everyone in the family, that's including you, uh, gifts, grace uh, to serve the church. And on top of that, he has appointed some apostles, prophets, uh, evangelists, and pastors and teachers. And they have been given leadership and authority in the church. And uh, we're sort of prone to uh, question authority. That's kind of what we do. And that's not all bad, but leadership, according to Jesus, is about becoming the greatest servant. And here we learn that our leaders aren't actually meant to put on a good show for us to sort of applaud or to watch. Our job is to equip God's people to serve the church and actually do the work of the ministry. We're training and preparing everyone in the family to excel in their God-given vocation. And of course, that includes you. So this is a really well-worn idea at this point, because we've been talking about this for several weeks, but it bears repeating. The person sitting next to you cannot do what God has prepared for you to do. They've got their own race to run. They have their own gifts. They have their own assignment. No one is going to run your race for you. That is yours to do. So our leaders are here to equip you to run your race with endurance, as the scripture says, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and hopefully with a ton of humility. And we have some really fantastic leaders at Riverbend, and I'm really honored to serve alongside you. It's a joy. Thank you for those of you who are leading Riverbend so well. Okay, verse 13. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So here in verse 13, we find the ultimate purpose of the church, that we become like Jesus in every way. That's it. It's kind of a big task when you think about it. But remember the context. Paul is talking about each of us as a part of a much larger whole. So this is not like I'm a fully mature person and you all have a lot of room to grow. That's actually an example of immaturity. He's saying that we all grow and become strong together or we sort of have missed the point. So the way that we get there is according to verse 13, uh, the unity of the faith and knowledge of Jesus. We're working from the same truth about who we are in Jesus, and we're coming from the same vision of the King. We all know and have experienced Jesus. And in time, through the, a, a process of discipleship, we become mature. Now, spiritual maturity is a major theme throughout Paul's writings, and that's for good reason. Um, this week, I was having a conversation with Brittany, who's on our team, and she's an amazing, amazing leader in our church. And she was talking with me about one of her daughters who needed a little bit of correction, as all kids do. By the way, Jeremy and Brittany are doing a fantastic job raising incredible human beings, and we're really proud of who they are becoming. Um, but like all kids, she needed a little bit of discipline. And the reason that uh, Brittany gave for disciplining her child was brilliant. She said that what her daughter had done for someone her age wasn't actually that big of an a, 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 that big of a deal. But if her behavior went unchecked for 10 years, it would become a huge problem in adulthood. And that's why you train your kids to do, to do what is right. And that's why this is so important. We've all seen adults who've I'm not outgrown their uh, emotional adolescence and, and it's embarrassing. And oftentimes it's just the root of a lot more trouble. And that's the reason that Paul uh, is talking about this. He's saying God has given us each other to encourage our growth and maturity in Jesus so that we would eventually become strong like he is strong in loving one another and forgiving one another and being patient and kind and courageous and bold and full of the Holy Spirit in time when we're all 
all together, we grow in our discipleship to him. It's all a process. And then verse 14 sort of finishes that idea. Follow along with me if you have your Bibles open. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves. So the results of this discipleship together is that we are able to withstand the storms of life without losing hope. And this is so important and so key, especially right now. I know 2020 has been heavy for so many of us, but I love what uh, Paul says in second Corinthians four, verse seven. He says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. That describes your courage and your resiliency as a Jesus follower. And the idea is this, that when you encounter hardship, what's really inside of you is what comes out. And in the case of the mature Jesus follower, the power of God is activated in you because you've been diligently being disciples together with your community. You are hard pressed, but you are not crushed. A friend of mine, when I think about this idea, I think about a friend of mine who leads an organization in the north of Africa. And it's this place that's filled with anti-Christian violence and crazy poverty and a bunch of other things that threaten his life. And he's had this debilitating heart condition for years that should keep him stateside next to first class medical facilities and all of that. But multiple times a year for more than a month, at a time, he goes straight into a region that where people want to kill him for sharing about Jesus and where he's constantly sick every time he's there. And it's like 120 degrees out. And I've asked him multiple times and said, man, why do you do this to yourself? And his answer is always the same because this is what Jesus has asked me to do. He's got a race that he's got to run and he has the maturity to endure the hardship that comes with it. And he's a super rad dude, by the way. He's got multiple advanced degrees and he's just crushing it on the mission field in his 60s. And I so want to be like that uh, when, I'm, when I'm his age. But this is just a, a, an example of what spiritual maturity can look like when we stay the course in community with other Jesus followers. So what is the evidence of your spiritual maturity? I know that you have some, you may not be like my buddy, Michael, just yet that will come in time, but we are all on our way together. And again, that is what Paul is emphasizing as we go along here. So just a couple more thoughts before you discuss verse 15, instead speaking the truth in love, we will become in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. Okay. So again, remember the context, the goal is to become like Jesus in every way. That's what we're going after together. But Paul isn't like beating you over the head with how you haven't made it yet. This is not a shame-based kind of conversation. He's making the case that we need to trust the process, that the living network of people who make up your believing community will help refine you over the course of your lifetime to become like Jesus. Let me say that one more time. He's encouraging us to trust the process that the living network of people who make up your believing community will help refine you over the course of your lifetime to become like Jesus. And the question is how, how does the Bible prescribe that or suggest that we do that by speaking the truth in love? That's, that's how we will grow to become mature. That's what verse 15 says. And can I just say that I believe this is the antidote to immaturity in the church, to backbiting and division in the church, to hurt feelings in the church, speaking the truth in love. This is what we do. This is one of the things that is a, uh, an example in our family. We are the ones who want to speak the truth in love. So unique weakness, I believe in our culture is that we are passive aggressive. 
We talk negatively about others behind their backs and we don't deal with our relational brokenness. And I've seen this way too many times to count, both in the church and outside of it. And we rationalize this behavior like a thousand different ways. But when we talk negatively about people behind their backs, a couple things happen. Number one, it's what the Bible calls gossip and slander and we're commanded not to do it. Number two, it's not loving. Nobody loves the feeling about being talked about negatively behind their back. And number three, we don't give the person that we're talking about the opportunity to grow from the thing that we're talking about them for. And this is what's becoming like a toxic cycle. And it does the opposite of building up the church. It does the opposite of growing us all into maturity in Christ. It actually tears down the church. So speaking the truth in love is more difficult than being passive aggressive. It's more difficult than gossiping behind, with, behind, uh, with people behind their backs. But it's actually helpful. It's encouraging. And it presents everyone involved, including you, the opportunity to grow from it. So let me give you an example. My personality, I have blind spots. I just do. Um, but I, the people who really love me, I rely on them often to speak the truth to me. And about the ways that I need to grow. And now I've gotten to the point where I'm actually asking for it. In fact, one of my favorite questions to my mentors right now is, what is the one thing that you think I can't hear or I don't want to hear? Because I really want to know about the areas of my life that need growth. And I I don't always like to hear what they have to say, but I am really grateful for people who love me, enough to tell me the truth in particular in my areas of weakness. So speaking the truth in love is the antidote to division and tearing down the church. This is what brings unity is when we have the character within ourselves to love one another through differences and to be able to speak the truth in love. And man, I I wasn't planning on saying this, but I can't imagine a more important time than this election cycle to show the sort of uh, maturity of character, to be able to look people in the eye that we deeply love, but profoundly disagree with and speak the truth to one another. This is a gift that we can give each other is to be temperate and kind and loving through the course of having disagreement and all the rest. This is what produces unity and growth in the church. Last verse before we're done from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So Paul goes back out to macro church. He's talking about you for a moment, but he's zooming back out to each part of of the body. That's you and me and everyone sitting to your left and right. We are all growing both individually and and together. And the metaphor of the full grown body is so useful and helpful. I love it. Each part is doing its work. Now, one of the things that we've experienced in the Western church is that we have a small handful of people who are sort of over functioning, who do the majority of the work, who do the majority of sharing the gospel, who do the majority of discipleship, who do the majority of teaching and leading and all the rest. And then a majority of people who are sort of under functioning. And this, again, is not to anyone's shame. This is sort of how we have sort of set up the church over the last couple of decades. But the reality is what I think God is doing right here, right now, especially with this rhythm of home church, is he's flattening that out a bit. He's calling all of us to be engaged and activated and each part doing its particular function. You have a role to play. I've been saying this for several weeks now, but we really do believe that God has given you a unique gift, a unique vocation, a unique circle of influence, and we believe that you have something valuable to contribute. So we're going to get into our conversation now, and I want to encourage you to honor each other's opinions, listen well, speak up and speak your mind, speak the truth in love, and let's get on with this conversation. I will see you next week.